Hello and welcome to all the attendees. We will be getting started here shortly in approximately two minutes. We'll be starting in two minutes. Hello everyone, and welcome to our a joint webinar uh, using artificial intelligence video analytics to improve situational awareness and accelerated response in critical infrastructure sites with access communication. Uh, access and Agent VI have had a strong partnership uh, going back since about 2005, and we have about a thousand deployments worldwide. Uh, what today we will have two presenters. First, we'll be hearing from Joe Morgan. He is the Critical Infrastructure Segment Development Manager at Access And on our behalf, we're going to have AJ Fraser. He is the Vice President of Business Development here at Agent VI. We'll leave uh, about 10 minutes at the end of the, of, of, of the presentation for some questions. So as the presentation goes on, feel free to write your questions through the webinar in the Q&A box. I am your uh, panelist and host, uh, Giovanni Gutierrez. I am the RSM in the Americas, and I'll be moderating this event for you guys. So Joe, uh, on behalf of everyone here, we, we are going to turn over the mic and thank you for all the attendees for allowing us to um, you know, humor you with some of our behind the scenes. So uh, I thank you for that. And uh, go ahead and share your screen and go, and you're ready to go, sir. Have a good one. Very good, thank you, Giovanni. Um, just want to test, make sure everybody can see the full slide here. Okay, good. So um, I appreciate that. I want to take a little bit of time just to uh, talk about talk about a cameras, uh, our cameras, and where they've evolved. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about this technology. I'd really like to talk a little bit about IP video and how it's driving more users and uses in the marketplace. You know, when it comes to um, surveillance cameras, you either had analog or digital, uh, better known as IP or network cameras. IP cameras, what are they really? Well, they've, they've evolved into a very sophisticated sensor. Um, it's actually a computer with a lens. You know, the lens provides the optical acuity. Um, there's processing abilities that can take that image and do all sorts of things. And, and now we have even more processing power that we can embed um, some artificial intelligence, deep learning processes within this chip. So if you think about it, I mean, look at six or seven years ago and, and picture yourself holding a camera and what it was then and possibly what it's going to be six or seven years from now. So the, the sensor or camera is, as you know. Joe, so, I'm sorry. Uh, Could you just change your screen to full uh, view? We can see the, the notes and everything, and so we can't see it. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Did it, did it work? No. Okay. Just so it's on the full screen. Yeah. 
Yeah, I thought I thought it was in uh full. Yeah, it's showing dual screen, Joe. I think you'll either need to switch the screen you're sharing or just go with it. I don't think you're going to be able to fix it by going to full screen. Okay, let me um stop share here and then I'll Okay, let's try this. Okay, are you still getting the notes and such? Yes, sir. All right, there's full screen. No, it's, a, it's in a dual monitor. I think you just need to go for it, Joe. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, no problem. All right. So, yeah, just continue and apologize for that. So, you know, let's just take a quick look of, of the evolution of the camera, where we've gone, okay, from 1996, where we uh, created the first network camera. And as you see, uh, 98, we had the first video encoder. As you migrate upwards, you see 99, you know, with the first uh, video chip, world's most solid security state camera. Um, we're starting to create a legacy here of innovation as, um, as we evolve more and more. So um, with uh, 2008, we introduced uh, H.264. And as you continue on, you can see the migration goes from you know, a, a simple IP camera with a lens to being able to um, spread IP conceptions to access control to pan and tilts in 2016, the technology to network radi uh, radar in 2017. And uh, 2018, we get into a little bit of what I spoke about about the involvement of the processing power. So um, no longer just a lens and a sensor, but the ability to add very unique processing abilities. And, and with that, we introduced LightFinder uh, 2.0, which significantly helped in uh, the lighting conditions, very challenging lighting conditions. And this also helps with our partner sets, companies like Agent VI that you know, rely on good imagery so their analytics can uh, be more proficient. And that, that all helps in creating a very sound system, a very sound analytic um, program that uh, ultimately reduces false alarms. So in 2020, you see uh, kind of the caveat there. We introduced the first deep learning camera. And uh, we all have, have heard about AI and machine learning. Well, it's it's becoming a reality in our space and especially in critical infrastructure. So um, companies now are looking for the ability to add remote processes to their, um, you know, to their surveillance, not only from a security standpoint, but as I move forward here, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what an IOT device is. So, um, an IoT device must have three uh, criteria as defined by uh, DHS, and that's to detect, uh, uh, authenticate, and update. So these, these are what they have required to um, put it in that category of a uh, IoT device. As we look at the expansion to other solutions, um, some of the areas that we can capitalize on by having additional processing power in the chipset and deep learning and machine learning abilities moving forward are three three pillars that we call the, um, the security, the process, and the safety. And this really opens up an array of, of different solutions that we can provide 
that really may not be security related, but might be a process within a plant or um, an oil field, the ability to uh, do some things like um, look at critical machinery with a thermal camera and see uh, if you can see heat indications to get alarms or um, the ability to, to create some really creative analytics to do some uh, verification of processes like um, the leaking and heating up and things of that nature. So we still have the mantra of you know, detection, verification, and identification. Um, this all fits in all three of these areas of security process and safety. So what makes it work, the key things are the open camera platform. The ACAP platform um, is the key to this. Um, it allows third-party developers to interface to a platform. The microprocessor chip size is reducing in size, and the functionality is actually increasing. So, you know, 10 years ago, our chipset and processing is 50 times what it was 10 years ago, and you know, what it's what's going to be 10 years from now. Um, you really only know science is creating, you know better and better capabilities of the chipset. So um, what this means for Axis, it's, uh, it's intended, um, since we manufacture all the chipsets and processing abilities, um, it's for Axis network products only. Uh, we have a unique image quality processing capabilities, like I spoke of, with, um, with Light Finder and things of that nature. So ACAP is Access Up Open Platform for Add-on Applications. Uh, it involves an ARTPEC chip family that's important, and um, that gives us the additional processing on the edge. And ARTPEC 7 is our most current chip, which allows us to do some more and more unique and, and really allows us to lead the way in a lot of those uh, areas I talked about earlier. And then finally, you know, where are we going? Where, where is the ability of a sensor, as I call it, going in relationship to um, developing more comprehensive, more, more difficult solutions in the marketplace, both in security, process, and, and safety? So we're going to be continuing to develop a more powerful processing chip that will allow partners, um, the ability to not in, only put one maybe um, analytic program on the edge of the camera, but two. And as this continues to develop and these chips get, get better and better at what they do, we look at more powerful systems uh, to do even more, uh, and very similar to modern day computers now that can do a, a multitude of tasks all in one, in one platform. So we look at that, uh, also the ability to continue to develop that deep learning aspect. As end users in critical infrastructure have noticed and have um, approved, if you will, this aspect in their everyday business. So the ability to take certain data points and learn from these data points um, to make an operations more proficient, to reduce cost, uh, increase revenue is very, um, you know, these companies are, are, are very high on this. So right now we're at a state where we're implementing solutions like this in the field and doing tests and trying to get a good idea of, all right, so we've got all these numbers, these ones and zeros and all this data, what can we do with it? and how can that reduce cost. So with that, we have significant, significant partner development. Um, companies that, that look at this and go, yeah, it makes sense for us to go this direction. We want to you know, work on a solution to this application. Or no, that's not our specialty. Uh, that's not really what we do, but we do this really good. And let's see if we can expand upon that. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce AJ, and uh, he will take it from an agent uh, VI standpoint and some of their most current technology and how it applies to critical infrastructure. So, AJ? All right. 
Thanks, Joe. Let's see here. All right, so I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna take what uh, Joe has introduced here, but we're gonna get a little bit more specific. Obviously, uh, Agent VI, we're an analytics company. Um, but for this presentation, you know, as I was planning this with Joe, I decided to try to look at some very specific ways uh, how analytics affects uh, it, particularly uh, situational awareness. Now, just I only have one slide about Agent VI, so just be merciful uh, for just a second. You know, we are we were founded in 2003, as Geo uh, mentioned. We've been actually integrating with Access since 2005. You know, those were the days we have to we used to literally ship software to Sweden, and they would compile it into the cameras. So we have a long history with Access. But along the way, you know, one of the advantages of being a, um, you know, an older analytics company, we've developed a broad platform. You're going to see some of those. I'm going to actually show a live system here in just a couple minutes. Uh, and we've really stuck to our strategy of being an open architecture that's open with uh, video management systems. Obviously, Axis is a great partner, um, you know, on the camera side. And then over the last five years, we've really been leading the market in terms of AI technology. We launched our first um, AI-based algorithm in 2016 with a completely new platform. But for today, let's talk critical infrastructure. So the first thing I'd like to point out, and for those on the call that are you know, involved in critical infrastructure, you'll notice uh, obviously very strong energy bend here, but that's just because those are the pictures I had. Um, but really, if you think about critical infrastructure, one of the, the big challenges, especially now as, as security is becoming more centrally you know, focused on critical infrastructure, there's two different types of problems that um, companies need to deal with. And I've termed them distributed cri critical infrastructure and concentrated critical infrastructure. And obviously anybody on this call that's doing anything in the sector will realize you typically have a mixture of both, even if they're operated different, like the generation side from the utility and distribution side, the stakeholder has to think of threats in two different domains. And these bring very different problems. Distributed critical infrastructure is uh, typically unguarded. In fact, it's almost always unguarded. Um, and it's also uh, typically remote. Uh, you know, the centralized critical infrastructure oftentimes is guarded, although by the way, not always, but it also becomes a single attack point. So it's a very high profile uh, target, uh, typically, you know, more area. So what this looks like in, in the real world is uh, you have to handle situational response differently depending on the physical uh, situation you're dealing with. When you have distributed sites, that would be substations, transfer you know, points for pumping, uh, you know, oil heads, whatever that might be, uh, these can cover multiple states. In fact, it can cover an entire country. Uh, they're usually in isolated locations. And what traditionally was done is you would just put a perimeter around the site and you'd say, well, the, you know, set off an alarm if, some, if somebody enters that site. But now, really companies need to think of coordinated attacks, which might be attacks on multiple sites across a grid, for example. So what you're really looking at is a concept of a super perimeter. It might be um, you know, all substations in a two-state two region, or it might be all pumping houses along a, a pipeline. These become a super perimeter. Now, when you get to concentrated uh, infrastructure like power generation, refineries, water treatment, uh, now, you might only have one location, but that location will typically cover hundreds of acres, and it will oftentimes have mixed use space. Could be offices, could be active, normal, you know, work zones, or could be lockout zones that are meant to be, um, have nobody in them for long periods of time except for service and maintenance. So one, one perimeter is not really good enough because in those sites, you actually have the ability for people for authorized people to be actively uh, you know, working on those sites. So now you have a concept of a sub perimeter, which is how do you subdivide that larger environment down to smaller environments so that you can accurately detect and then also do um, incident response. So you have very different challenges as an infrastructure company. So now let's talk a little bit about the way analytics would affect this. And they're, they're really, from our experience, by the way, Agent VI, we, we do a lot. 
in critical infrastructure. Uh, do a lot in road transportation, cities, but you know, critical infrastructure is, is really kind of the sweet spot for us. And the problem you have, like you look at this picture on the right, I, I love pictures like this. And, and, and frankly, this is, this, is, you know, this is a real world, except maybe the only difference is that's a small wall. That's not one of these you know, 100 foot wide walls with cameras on it. And one of the things that happens is as you add more cameras, you do get more coverage, but you create like a blizzard effect. When there isn't, first off, you'll miss what's happening. And secondly, if there is an incident, you literally have too many cameras to know where to start. Analytics can help reduce that effect. But there are four keys that you need to consider to take advantage of analytics. First, and this is, this is really the bane of uh, the existence of the analytics industry, you have to reduce the nuisance alarms. Because it, it doesn't matter whether you got 10 cameras or 1,000 cameras. If I have a camera that every time it rains, it produces 40 false alarms or 100 false alarms, those operators are going to stop looking at that camera. In fact, they're going to learn to look to, to stop looking at those cameras even when the weather is good because they get used to clearing so many false alarms. Nuisance alarms is really the Achilles heel of anal analytics. So you have to reduce the nuisance alarms. But then once you've done that, you need to find methods to be able to sort what is relevant and what is not relevant. Because just because an alarm comes in does not mean that it's necessarily an incident. And so it can be a valid alert, but you have to have a way to sort what matters and what doesn't matter. And I'll actually show a demonstration of this uh, in just a minute. Uh, you need a way to be able to search quickly because if you, even if you have, let's say two or 300 cameras and you have an incident, the chances that you would have thought what, to, what alarms to set up on those cameras is really, it's non-existent. What, what you now know is I have an incident unfolding maybe at my substations or maybe at one of my power generation points. Uh, and you need a way to be able to very quickly look backwards through video to isolate and track what's, unholding, what's unfolding. You might be looking backwards 10 minutes, but you might be looking backwards two days. Maybe you're looking for a vehicle that had been parked outside of a site because now all of a sudden you're wondering if that vehicle had been casing multiple sites. So you might be looking for vehicles, maybe going back two days, maybe going back seven days at, at 20 sites. I mean, you, you know, that's, that's literally thousands of hours of video that you would need to process and you would need to review to find something. Well, we're gonna show you how, how our search tool can help with that. And then finally, as simple as it might sound, uh, it, it, it's really worth saying, the sites need to have a way that you can connect and you can manage them. Otherwise, you know, a site with cameras that you can't connect to and you can't apply analytics is not very useful. So let's talk a little bit about the way um, uh, we can help with that. So first, nuisance alarms. Now I'm just gonna show a couple examples because as I keep saying, I have a live system I'm gonna jump to here in about, you know, probably just a little bit more than 10 minutes. Um, but one of the great benefits of AI is the very nature of the way these algorithms work. We, we did our first beta, actually our first beta test, now that I remember, was at a, a large utility in 2014. And we learned a lot from that beta test and we launched our commercial product in 2016. Well, the things that we've learned is that when you build these algorithms correctly, by the way, you can't start with just alpha, you know, out of the box toolkits from NVIDIA or Intel. You've got to do a lot of work to build a good AI system. But when you build it correctly, these algorithms are very accurate. They give you precise object classification. That's something we struggle with with the older analytics methods. But they also can give you good object classification without all of the manual tweaking and configuration settings that you know a lot of people were used to. And they have one other huge benefit. They give you that with lower false alarm rates. Now, the reason is actually not magic. The reason is the new AI algorithms, when they're built correctly, they're built around positive identification. They look for a person in the scene. They look for a vehicle in the scene. They look for a truck, a bus, a bicycle. And once they identify that, they classify it. However, the benefit of that is a tree does not look like a person. A bush does not look like a person. And so what you end up with is a lot of the false alarms, things that used to be nuisance alarms, go away simply because the algorithm no longer sees them. They're invisible to the algorithm. These are two great examples. Steam used to be a terrible problem for analytics. 
but now steam does not provide a, a, an issue because we can see through on this left image and see a person raindrops obstructed you know uh, video um, you know imagery again not a problem for the newer AI algorithms just kind of sticking with the seam showing some other examples in fact that uh, camera on the left I believe is from a rooftop of an access office somewhere in Europe uh, that was a live agent VI system, um, and I'm pretty sure that was an access office. And here you can see snow. You know, we're able to detect a person walking through that snow. And in the old algorithms, that would have been just nearly impossible um, to detect. But then looking at the right, another example. You know, detecting a person with very low contrast walking down this uh, this railroad track with bugs and uh, you know obstructions in the image. Once again, these algorithms just don't struggle with the same kind of nuisance alarms. They're not zero, but they're literally orders of magnitude versus um, the older algorithms that we used to uh, we used to offer. And just kind of sticking with this, just to show some good critical um, infrastructure examples. Uh, one of the you know the real challenges with critical infrastructure is you oftentimes don't have good lighting conditions. So this is a great example on the left of an intrusion. And you can see the, the camera saturates from full black in the upper left-hand corner to almost 100% white in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, you know, these newer algorithms just don't struggle with the same kind of issues um, that, you know, normally would be faced in the past. Um, IR and infrared, once again, work fine. So great applications for critical infrastructure, but largely because if you have a thousand cameras, you can do this math yourself. And that those thousand cameras produce on average, let's say one to four false alarms a day. Though that's gonna generate literally eight hours of somebody just clicking and clearing false alarms. That's an entire shift of somebody just clearing, no, that's a bug. No, that's a piece of trash. No, that's a tree blowing. So these algorithms do very good um, in these situations. All right, but let's talk, it's a little bit more than just eliminating uh, nuisance alarms. So let's talk about what you can actually do with the algorithms. Now I'm gonna, only gonna share two very quick slides because I can actually demo this better than talk about slides. But I wanna just illustrate when, when it comes to analytics, there's really two different ways to think about analytics, at least from an agent VI perspective. Not everybody, by the way, offers the features I'm about to show, but from an agent VI perspective, if you know what you're looking for, you can generate uh, a rule to be able to say, um, generate a detection when you detect something. So you can define target classes, which the AI algorithms do a very good job of now classifying targets. And then you match it against the behavior. And then you can set off an alert if something happens. A vehicle entering a substation, um, a car parked out in front of a power utility, uh, people, at a pumping house, you know, and you know, on a pipeline. So you can set up these, these different rules. But in a lot of situations, you're not quite sure what you're looking for. And really what you're looking for is situational awareness. So we have anomaly detection for that. This is where you don't know what you're looking for, but you'll, you'll know it when you see it. Now, this is a great example. This is actually a city in the United States from last spring. This is a live agent VI system. You can see on the left, the camera view um, you know, of what that street normally looks like. And then you can see on the right, there was a peaceful protest march happening last spring. And what anomaly detection does is it looks at a seam, it learns that pattern over time. And then it, 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 then if something different happens, it just simply pops that alarm and says, you should pay attention to this camera. Something different is happening. Doesn't mean something wrong is happening. Doesn't mean something bad. It just means something different is happening. So it's a great backdrop to analytics. If you know what you're looking for, like a substation, just set up a perimeter and set off an alarm if somebody's in there after hours. But if you maybe outside the substations, you've got a playground and you can't set up an alarm because people are legitimately there all, all kinds of time of the day, but maybe you would set up anomaly for that outside perimeter because if people were to be on the playground at 2 a.m., that might be something you wanna pay attention to, all right? So Anomaly gives you that, that tool. Now I'm gonna skip this slide because I can actually demonstrate this better, but I wanna do one more slide before I jump over to a live system. And, and this is to illustrate what I'm about to demonstrate. So when Agent VI launched our AI 
um, system in 2016, we launched it initially as a cloud-based service. Now, the way, the way we work is we have a piece of software that sits out at the edge, that sits out at your camera network, that processes the frame-by-frame -frame video, and then that connects back to a core. There's one central core, and the core can do things like, for example, for anomaly detection, it can do long-term statistical patterning. Um, you know, Joe mentioned uh, the critical importance of pushing updates, so the core keeps all of its edge software up to date. Uh, the core is also what gives the ability to do centrally manage multiple sites. Now, just to be clear, you don't have to use our cloud. So you can see on the left, you could build your own core. And in fact, we have utilities and critical infrastructure customers doing exactly that. Same architecture, it's just in their case, they put a core in their own data center versus using our cloud. All right, now with that, moving at the speed of light, since we all know that PowerPoint dulls the soul, let's go to something more interesting. So what I've now just switched to is I've switched to um, actually a, a live browser. So I'm going to log into an actual Inovi system. So here I go. Now, uh, as a disclaimer, this is a real system. I have live cameras connected. So in fact, if we see a bank robbery happen while I'm giving this demo, uh, that is really happening in real time. So the first thing you can see is what I was sharing a minute ago about the federation that's built into Anovi. That's our, our AI platform. Now that federation was built in because we realized a lot of our large customers had geographically distributed sites and they needed a way to be able to actually manage setting up rules, uh, aggregating alarms, aggregating reporting data because we can do business intelligence also. Uh, or just being able to manage their sites in one interface uh, without having to go through a lot of hoops and hurt, you know, uh, jump, jump through hoops and over hurdles um, to be able to uh, set up, you know, their analytics. So this is a real system. You can see I have cameras available all over the world. In fact, just to illustrate this, uh, I don't know if my team back in Israel likes this, but here's the live view. It's, it's right about 630 in the offices in Rosh Ein, Israel. Uh, you can see, you know, right now, that's a live view of those offices. Um, that's executive corridor, so not a lot of activity happening tonight uh, back in the office in Israel. Uh, there was earlier today. But let's go to something more interesting. So since I can look all over the world, I'm going to actually look at a rail project. Uh, I mean, maybe that's transit, maybe that's more critical infrastructure, but it's a fun camera. Because this is actually a live camera view of a camera in Japan. So it's nighttime in Japan. So this is the actual views you can see. Uh, and you can see some of my engineers set up some different um, alerts for moving on the uh, railway. Uh, and actually this is a road crossing, a grade crossing. It does not get a lot of activity, but I can see here, if I jump over to my monitor view, well, I can see, uh, you know, just a little while ago, uh, earlier this morning, uh, there was a vehicle that did cross. So if I double click this, I can see an eight second verification clip. Now, again, even though this is not in the energy sector per se, I do want to point out this it, it, for people that have worked with analytics in the past, they will know this is a terribly difficult scene. I, I'm detecting a vehicle at probably about 50 meters, I would guess. I've got obstructions of poles. I've got, uh, well, actually I've got some transformer boxes. I've got power lines. And here I'm able to detect this vehicle with virtually no, visi no open visibility, very accurate with a lot of obstruction. You will also notice just for kicks, if I go back to this camera and I just look at the rules, I could change them now if I wanted to, but I'm not going to. I can see in this zone here, I've defined a zone, but one of the things you will notice it would, is not present. There's no masking of these bushes. There's no fancy calibration tweaking. All we did is define a perimeter around that roadway. And we said, tell me if you detect a person, a motorcycle or a vehicle in that zone, that's it. The AI will do the rest. If you've got 10 cameras, you can tweak. If you've got a hundred or more cameras, you just realistically, even if you had a dedicated technician, that's too many cameras to be constantly tweaking masking things. The AI makes that whole painful process go, go away. 
But just so to show that we're not just uh, about railway crossings in Japan, let's go look at another camera. This one will actually be in the States. Uh, sorry, I do have some critical infrastructure cameras here, but these are these are really just video clips playing on a loop. You know, so I can show you if you wanted. Okay, oh, here we go. Sorry, I can show you the you other know, typical person jumping a fence. You know, I can you know I can show you you know vehicle stopped at a gate. But since these aren't live cameras, I, I have more fun doing live cameras. So let's go to this camera here because this one's really live. Like. Uh, you know, it's actually pretty slow right now. It's still fairly early in the morning uh, at this at this city, but I can actually see what's happening. So once again, you can see where centrally I can manage this camera. I've got rules set up. Um, I find it interesting. I just noticed this earlier today that the person on a pavement, I guess people decided, well, that's stupid because people are allowed to be on this walkway. So somebody changed it to vehicles and bicycles. So I guess a little head game there. It's a person on a pavement, but it's actually going to detect vehicles and bicycles. But you can see it's, you know, it's on this uh, sidewalk area. That makes a, a lot more sense. There's a stop vehicle zone set up here in this, um, you know, sort of awning area. But that obviously doesn't happen very often. But so let's go take a look now and see what's been happening on this camera. So here, I jump over to the camera. Uh, you can see there is some activity. So for example, um, here, let's see. Uh, actually, this is a pretty good one. It looks like it was raining earlier today. So here, a um, lot of bicycle activity. You can see the sidewalk area is wet. Those would be valid detections. But, but one of the things I said in terms of using analytics for critical infrastructures, you need to be able to sort quickly. So here, I've got a pretty busy, a busy uh, situation. This is a public street. But let's say, you know what, I didn't care about bicycles. I only wanted to detect vehicles. Well, I could very quickly just go here and look at object type. And let's just say, um, well, uh, I only want to find, you know, um, let's just see if there's any trucks. OK, so here we have these little small service trucks that go up and down the sidewalk. You saw all I did was I just sorted very quickly. Now, imagine if you're um, an energy producer and you've got a pipeline where you've got cameras at every one of your pumping stations covering 12 states, you know, hint, hint. Um, you might have a lot of activity at those stations. It's legal activity, but you need a way that you can very quickly sort this down. I could also, for example, if I wanted to filter, you know, maybe I don't care about that. Maybe I do care about bicycles. And now I'm only showing the, the bicycles. Now I am gonna say one thing, because I just noticed this a second ago. If I go back to this view, to anybody paying close attention, you'll see I've got a mix here of real-time rules, but look what I also have. We had an anomaly. Now, this is not a bank robbery. This is not a crazy anomaly, but what you can see is the system has learned this camera well enough to know that at this time, basically at 8 a.m. in the mornings, this street does not usually have vehicles parked on it, and there's a vehicle stopped there. That's actually a perfect example of an anomaly. Somebody would look at that, they would say nothing to worry about, but let's say that was a truck or that was some other vehicle that was suspicious. Hey, why is there a large service truck stopped there along the road? It's been stopped there for a half hour. Anomaly detection, this is a perfectly valid anomaly. Um, and you might wanna maybe dispatch a, you know, um, a guard or something to go over there and just make sure that everything is fine. All right, now I said, one of the keys was to be able to sort quickly, but let's talk about another key here. I also want to be able to find things that I might not have thought to look for. So let's just for kicks do an investigation. Now, again, this is a real camera. Honestly, I'm not exactly sure what we're about to find here. This is a, this is a heroic demo since we always like to know exactly what we're gonna find, but let's just say, I'm, I wanna look at this sidewalk area. Actually, even, even let's just say, I don't care so much about the sidewalk, I want to find people because I have a door entryway here and I wasn't setting up any alarms for people. So let's search for people. All right, so I've, I've now detected that zone. I've got a rule. We'll just do a moving in an area that's quick. Here objects. Uh, let's see, well, let's get rid of the pre-populated the pre detections. I'm going to add a person. Well, let's, just, let's do it even more fun. Let's just say we're going to look, see if anybody's wearing red. Okay, so a person wearing red. Again, this is a live camera. I'm going to now look on this camera since I know it's morning time there, let's go ahead and look backwards for 24 hours. 
All right. I think I've got everything set up. Now we're doing an investigation. So you can see now we're going through. Okay. All right. So far, so good. Love it when technology works. All right. So it, it took us um, about, what was that? About 10 seconds to sort through and to find an example of some, you know, somebody wearing red going through. Oh, well, oh, this is cool. Oh, I love it when this happens. Um, you will also notice it's a very rainy day. So you can, you can make the, the point here, all of this rain that we now see, because I, I searched on this person, did not set off any false alarms in the other images that I was just showing you. So that's a that's a pretty good that's a pretty good test. If I you know if I gotten rid of you know um, the color, let's say I you know in this case you know here I just want to do you know just all people. Let's see is my uh, okay still have my zoom there. You know looking back 24 hours, you're going to see that we're you know by sorting by red, I sorted out, you know, there's obviously a lot more people uh, going in and out of this detection zone uh, here, but I only found the person's red. So that's great um, search behavior, uh, you know, for our system. And it's using the same basic AI algorithm. So one of the things that um, Agent VI, it's, it's part of our patent from 2003, it's actually part of our name, Agent VI, was this idea that we could create an edge agent that basically creates metadata, feature, um, you know, our own proprietary, we call it feature stream. And that metadata can be stored for search, which means I could search one camera, I could search 10 cameras going back 24 hours. And that's 240 hours of video. I don't have to reprocess that. I don't have to scroll through it. It's just going to be this fast um, as, as illustrated again by, you know, what was a completely live camera. All right, so uh, in planning for the event, we wanted to try to keep the PowerPoint and the demo as concise as possible to leave time for questions. I, I could demo more stuff, but th at this point, I would be just goofing off. Uh, oh, by the way, you can notice one of the cameras is offline right now, so you get health status. This is actual video-based health status, so uh, you're gonna be able to, to know, even like bad video, if, if, a, if a camera lens is obstructed because it's got too much you know, dirt on it, uh, we're going to be able to detect health of that video, you know, so you actually have a way to see that your system is up and operational. Uh, a lot more things here. I already mentioned we have reporting tools. So I think with that, uh, Gio, let me go ahead and um, hand it back to you. And so you can, hopefully we had some good questions come in through the Q&A and Joe and I can, you know, try to tackle them. Thank you, AJ. Thank you, Joe. And we do have some questions here. Uh, first question that uh, we have is, what is the accurate range for uh, SI to work? Uh, SI, um, I assume that's analytics. Um, I, I'll just answer the question from a analytics standpoint. So um, we, it, for our best practices guide, we publish like a table of resolution versus distances. Um, but I will say with the new AI algorithms, they do remarkably well, way beyond our engineers, you know, sort of um, best practices recommendations. So we frequently have customers. In fact, we have a, a large customer with access, uh, you know, a major transit authority in the Northeast. And I, and I was at their site with testing a couple months ago and um, they were getting valid testing, um, you know, out, oh man, it was probably 300 meters, 400 meters. I mean, way beyond our best practice. We kept saying, hey, by the way, we're not guaranteeing it'll work, but it was working great. These new algorithms do super well with um, low quality video. In that case, it was definitely not access. The access cameras were working great. It was just, you know, bad weather looking out over such long distances at some point, you know, so, so we have a, a table with best practices for resolution, but you know, this, we've extended the distance of practical analytics with our new AI algorithms more than double for sure what it used to be with our older algorithms. So that if you have more, if you need more specifics, just contact Agent VI and we can have a sales engineer actually work through some calculations based on your actual scene. 
Sure. And AJ, just uh, to update everyone here, uh, it was actually what is the accurate range for AI to work? They uh, made a correction on the. Oh, okay. All right. So they, I get so, it. So well, you didn't answer the question. question. Yes, yeah. yes. Your inference on what they meant was spot on. Uh, okay. That's the is, that's the original AI. See, that's it. Uh, that goes to show that our artificial that our intelligence uh, it works <laughs> just as well as our artificial intelligence. That's right. <laughs> uh, can this be done on an all-prem, excuse me, can this be done all on-prem in the camera without internet connectivity? Um, okay, so there's two parts to that. So first off, um, it can be all, we don't need internet connectivity. Okay, that's, that's not a requirement. Um, it, I will, I need to say though, yeah, for customers that have either permanent connection and use our cloud or have like uh, internet connectivity they can open up for updates, they're gonna get a much better system experience because we found for large systems, you know, that ability to update and to maintain is built into Anobi. It, I mean, it's kind of more of a true modern architecture where software is constantly being updated. It's, it's scalable, but you know, uh, one of our largest customers here in the US is a big utility that has an entirely on-prem built system in their own uh, in their own data center. So we do not need uh, internet connectivity. Okay, thank you, AJ. And the next question is, what is additional compute requirement even if we consider access edge-based analytics? Um, yeah, that, that's, a, that's not a question that can be just put in uh, a one size lunch pail um, to date myself a, a little bit. Um, you know, because compute, first off, compute um, is partially a factor of the resolution, the frame rate, um, the activity in the scene can affect compute some, maybe 10, 20%. Um, yes, obviously, if you're running um, a lot of the uh, frame by frame processing in a camera, then you don't need that compute in a server. Um, but then sometimes for a lot of our largest customers, they're, we're, they're not installing us until long after they've installed their camera and their VMS. And they're just saying, we want you to piggyback on the VMS stream, which creates a, a, a actually a pretty complicated uh, architectural analysis. So I think that question, we, you, you'd almost need to present um, a use case to Agent VI, our sales engineers, or let us create a couple different scenarios. Um, obviously, using access cameras can help a lot, but um, but you know sometimes it's not quite that simple. So so I, I can't unfortunately just give one turnkey answer for that. Totally understand, AJ. Thank you so much. Uh, and we have another question: How can this artificial intelligence be applied to PTZ cameras? Oh, okay. This might get me in trouble with my friend Joe and, and Axis. Um, we, because we used to be a leader in PTZ camera analytics, um, and and we made a lot of money from that that analytic. But I, but I'm going to give up a little bit of a secret about that. To really effectively do that, you need to custom integrate the analytic to the specific camera, and not even just like Axis versus somebody else, but the actual model because you need to know what the presets are from the camera language. And that's proprietary, meaning every camera manufacturer has its own way to communicate presets to the rate it slews. All of that is, is non-standard. And so, and, and so that's fine. We used to you know, add, it was not really the analytic. We had to add sort of a wrapper around it to say, if the camera's slewing or at this preset, then use this background calibration, things like that. Uh, honestly, PTZs are not as common as they were even five years ago. Now, this this will be a good one, wink, wink to Joe. And, and the reason is obvious. If you even go back five years, let alone 10 years ago, PTZ cameras solved a problem that is now solved by higher resolution cameras. Because wherever a PTZ camera is looking, by definition, it's not looking someplace else. And so a lot of customers realize, well, I'd rather put up a 1080p or a four megapixel camera and just see the entire scene than have a PTZ. So, um, so we've seen a big, big reduction in sale of PTZs, which also means a big reduction in sale of PTZ licenses for Agent VI. So today, if you wanna run our new AI algorithms on a PTZ camera, 
again, it's going to require a little bit of sales engineering um, design support because really what's going to happen is when that camera is moving, the algorithm is going to be unsettled. And, and until, it's, until it settles into a new location and basically takes the minute or two to kind of readjust to that new location, you're potentially going to get a lot of false alarms, which we don't, which we don't like. So, um, so the PTZ is kind of the, it's, it's, it's a problematic area right now. There's not as many PTZ cameras out there, although there's still a lot, but they also tend to be older cameras. So now, you know, I've got that issue where I have to, you know, now deal with a customer's older camera, even though they'd like to be working with the newer high megapixel camera. So, so talk to us about PTZs. We do have customers using PTZs, but it's a tricky design, um, you know, uh, environment. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you very much, AJ. Our next question is a pretty simple one. Uh, is there a solution for vehicle tailgate detection? Uh, so so tail, tailgate detection, uh, and this is actually the way it's been done for years in the industry, is, is really um, a form of, you know, uh, who's following who detection. Right. So the way you would do tailgate detection um, in the case of a vehicle is you basically detect vehicle one and then you have sort of a, a timeout option for vehicle two to detect like somebody, you know, two vehicles crossing through a gate. So there is a way to configure environments to do that. With vehicles, frankly, it's much more easier than people because there is kind of a physical limit to how closely vehicles can 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 uh, follow versus, you know, people tailgating has always been problematic because you can have two people literally like be shoulder to shoulder so close that it's really hard to distinguish them. Uh, but vehicle tailgating is something that can be done, but you sort of have to know how to set up the system to do it well. And obviously camera placement can make a big difference in how well that works also. Um, so for example, parking garages, which is one of the common areas where we get the request for tailgate detection. Sometimes the answer is no, just because the camera placement, you literally can't see well the second vehicle because the camera is, you know, is it mounted at nine feet high, you know, 40 feet away looking straight onto the vehicle. So, so the uh, camera placement has a big impact on how well we would do vehicle tailgating. Thank you once again, AJ. A uh, great answer. Uh, the next question is, is there an on-premise version of Enovi where the video source will be a VMS that resides in a closed network? Um, I, well, I think the answer is sort of yes. I mean, if, if the question <laughs> yes. is, would we be on-prem in a separate closed network? It, it, the, the secret of closed networks is nothing is 100% closed. So you could put us on prem in a data center at a customer, and the camera uh, and VMS could be on another network within that customer's data center, or maybe even at another data center. And obviously, to process the video, we need to be able to get to it. And so you might have to open, you know, a VPN or a port, you know, or, or you know, a private network, you know, connection to that other data center, but. I mean, the answer is we, we're, we're doing some pretty large deployments where the customers have said, I need you to just get video from the VMS and the video we're pulling is from a, you know, a locally installed, you know, VMS uh, and with a locally installed Anovi. So I don't see any reason, any scenario where that question would come out bad. I mean, we do all kinds of configurations like that. Totally understood. Okay. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, what about cybersecurity? Well, okay. So on the on the cybersecurity uh, standpoint, um, you know, we, we really feel like uh, this is an area as as an industry. Now, I hope hopefully I'm not painting with too big a brush, but as an industry, we talk a lot about cybersecurity, but really as vendors. I'm shocked sometimes when I go out to customer sites, including in critical infrastructure, and I see stuff that's going on. Like I, like there's there's one um, you know um, company I know in the critical infrastructure you know field. In fact, actually, I could probably name two now that I'm thinking about it, just off the top of my head. That's literally still has ten year old systems running on um, out of support versions of Windows, 
you know, like literally, like if they went to Microsoft said I would need a hot fix, they'd be like, yeah, we stopped uh, issuing uh, security updates for that five years ago. So, so this is an issue. This is really a dirty issue for our whole our whole industry. Now, on the agent VI front, you know, I'd like to say we were real visionary, but the truth is, when we launched our AI system, we built it from ground up. We kind of had to, um, and we built it first for deployment. Uh, originally, it was uh, deployed at AWS, and then it was deployed, um, you know, uh, at Google Cloud. We've also done Azure deployments. And one of the things we realized when we went to these newer coding methods that cybersecurity is one of the things that's just built into the concept. So for example, internal certificate communication. So even within our own system, you have authenticated communications between our applications so that if someone were to compromise a server, you know, at one part of our system, uh, our software running on another part of our system would detect that and would lock out that, you know, that communication. So cybersecurity was sort of built into it, uh, Anovi because we just built it at a time when that's the way you built software. Um, uh, you can't go back and make something cyber secure after the fact. You kind of have to build it from scratch. Anovi was built starting in 2015 when a lot of these methods were in place. So we, we think we've, we've got a great leading you know, edge on the cybersecurity front. Thank you for that. And our final question for today, so that that way we can be conscious of everyone's time. What do you see yourselves developing on the edge in the future? Well, okay, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that. It's sort of a trick answer. Um, because if you remember the way our architecture works, you know, the video itself is processed into our featured metadata out at the edge. The, the analytics as a system is aggregated at the core. And the core, by the way, does not need to do a lot of heavy duty processing because it doesn't need to process the video. But because of that, we're able to add features and capabilities very easily because typically we don't need to change anything in our edge because that edge is, is really think of it as just a, a sort of a video converter, it converts it to agent VI proprietary metadata. And then we can do things like add new kinds of statistical tools or different types of business intelligence or different APIs to share it with other systems uh, or new analytics methods. So when COVID came along, some of the new capabilities we offered were literally done in days because we didn't need to change anything about the core algorithm that created the metadata. We just needed to add you know, new ways, for example, to detect grouping, things like that. Uh, so our, our architecture is very flexible. And by the way, it's all up to date. So when you update a core, it will automatically push updates to the edge. So we no longer have this problem where we have, you know, maybe, you know, cameras running, you know, 200 cameras running out at 100 different sites, two cameras a site, and they're out of date because it's physically hard to actually get there and update the camera. All of that's, all of that is done automatically because uh, updating is built into the concept of our system. Because as I said a minute ago, cybersecurity actually dictates that's that's like probably the number one mantra of you know cybersecurity for update frequently, keep things up to date. So thank you, AJ. And with that, first and foremost, we want to thank our partners, Access Communications, uh, specifically Joe Morgan. He is the segment development manager for critical infrastructure at Access Communications. You can contact him at joe.morgan at access.com. His telephone number and contact information is on the slide that you can see there. And thank you once again, uh, AJ Frazier. He is our Vice President of Business Development. You can contact him at a.fraser at agentvi.com. If you have any questions, any additional technical questions or anything that may come up in the, in the uh, pricing or any future technical questions that may come up, feel free to reach back out to Agent VI at sales at agentvi.com. AJ Frazier's contact telephone number is there. Thank you each one of the attendees here for participating in our live webinar using artificial intelligence video analytics to improve situational awareness and accelerate response in critical infrastructure sites. I hope that you found all of this information uh, to be able to edify you in your uh, security field. 
And like I said, thank you so very much. And everyone have a great Tuesday.